welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today I am joined by founder and CEO at Payslip, Fidelma McGurk. Payslip, if you're not familiar, is the first global payroll management SaaS, that software as a service, business for international employers. And we're going to hear a lot more about how Fidelma and Payslip utilize digital technologies to empower global employers to centralize control of multinational payroll processes and payroll providers through smart automation a little bit later in the podcast. But for those not familiar with Fidelma, she is a highly experienced CEO who has experience working in a multinational company managing offices across 21, yes, that's 21 countries, before pursuing her entrepreneurial path into consultancy, where she supported many businesses requiring support with aggressive growth through international expansion and process optimization. Fidelma joined Going for Growth, the brainchild of Paula Fitzsimmons, which is focused on peer support as a means of assisting women entrepreneurs who wish to grow their businesses. We will find out a little bit more about that again later in the podcast, but very relevant right now as we've just experienced and enjoyed International Women's Day. I will also put a link to the group on the episode notes for those interested in finding out more about it. Um, But very quickly, it's uh, goingforgrowth.com. But after this, in July 2015, Fidelma decided she wants to launch a business that could help companies to regain control of its global payroll process. And after a lot of hard work, research, sweat on shore and creative design, Payslip was born. So founder, CEO, entrepreneur, women in leadership advocate and digital technology global payroll expert, Videl McGurk, welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Fantastic. Great to talk to you, Nick. What a great introduction. <laughs> oh, you too. It's so relevant I'd love as well. to meet her. I'd love yeah. to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you say, we just experienced International Women's Day, which is a, a fantastic um, day, which is really, uh, I guess, quite relevant to some of the work that you've, you've been doing and, and some of the things that you're championing for, which I'm excited to get into later into the podcast. But if we start things off. Five quick questions. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey into payroll and how it's led you to become a founder and CEO of Payslip? Sure. So as you mentioned, uh, in a previous life, uh, pre-Payslip, I was um, uh, director of international operations for a multinational tax company. Um, And during that time, I set up operations across 21 countries. And what we found from a governance perspective, that it was very difficult to have um, a single visibility or a single uh, dashboard of what was happening with payroll at any particular point in time across all of those 21 countries. Um, and then as you want to plan your business and pull, um, look at, do a deep dive, for example, into uh, cost drivers within your payroll across the different countries, there was no easy way to get consolidated or multi-country comparative reporting. Sure. Um after I'd left that company, I remembered uh, the difficulty with that and was um, considering different options of what business to establish. And when I researched the market to find whether there was a platform available that we'd missed over the years, I, I could see that there wasn't anything available in the market. And that was uh, what led me to found Payslip and build uh, the platform that we have today. Fantastic. Now, my, my research tells me that you always found it quite challenging yourself to find sort of payroll companies that could actually deliver what they were promising. And then even when you did, working with them was often quite a complicated and often time consuming process because of a variety of things such as data protection policies or capability issues. So was it sort of some of those frustrations that I guess inspired you to develop your solution in Payslip? Uh, uh, yes and no. So wh- when you go to a particular, when you're in- investing in a comp- in a country and you need a, a local payroll service provider, um, by definition, they they usually take a very accountancy approach to the service provision. I mean, sure. it is a, a an accounting function, and a lot of their operations are usually designed in accordance with that. So it's not necessarily designed to be digital enabled for the business uh, customer. Um, and what I found over the years was there you would never have issue or rarely have issue with their core capability or depth of experience for the payroll services for their country themselves. But the entire project management around the plan of work for the year, the calendar, the compliance requirements, um, the visibility around the, the 
the service uh, definitions and SLA management, that was what was missing. So when you take uh, the fact that they're really good at their actual service provision, but that the wrapping around it to make it visible and clear and easy when you're an overseas client, when you take that and multiply that experience across multiple countries, well, then global payroll becomes very messy. So oh. it was really trying, we were in building the place of platform, we were trying to build a platform that would um, be an umbrella across all the countries and across all the in-country requirements to make the delivery of the service more unified and cohesive. Okay, well that that makes sense. I know that's something that um, rings really true in your in your website, which obviously I researched beforehand. Is you know how strong Payslip is as a you know in terms of its tech and its uh, its technology. And obviously, right now, hot topics within the payroll world are things like robotic process automation. People are interested in artificial intelligence and how those kind of technologies are going to influence and, and affect payrolls. I'm imagining there's some huge benefits to both those types of technology in relation to data exchange on a global scale. But I'm still seeing a, a fair bit of sort of hes hesitancy, if you like, for people wanting to adopt some of these new technologies. So what do you think will be the main reason some businesses are reticent to consider automating its own payroll processes? And what are the potential benefits from your side? Um, I think I think there's a few ways of looking at it. So firstly, I think in terms of reticence, uh, I don't as was in our clients, they're coming to us looking for digital uh, experience and digitization of their process. So we're probably um, dealing with the clients who are who've left resistance behind them, you know. Okay. But generally, generally in the market, I think when you look at what processes have been digitized, there's um, we can see in the history that the first processes that were digitized and smart software was built for was in accounts. Uh, accounting, accounts management, accounts payable. So yeah. really good leaders in the market there are companies like Xero, Paychex. They have already be, um, built very customer friendly interfaces for what is a mandatory business process. Um, though still many of them are targeting the SME market and then they're built in country. Um, then the next processes that were being digitized were general HR processes from, as I say, from cradle to retirement, from cradle to grave. So everything from recruitment through to retirement. Um, and when it comes to payroll, I actually think it just, it's kind of the last mile that, that people are only coming to now within their systems. And, and I think there's some of the reason for that is because, um, it, you know, that whole, adage of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. People, yeah. payroll professionals always make sure people get paid. So if people are always getting paid, there's a, probably a general assumption that the system is working. Um, and then to go and digitize it, they might go and, and target systems that they don't see as working as efficiently up till then. So I think, that first of all, it's kind of a maturity of digitization uh, in the market. And now it's getting to payroll Within companies themselves, I think really the conversations opened up about what does automation and AI mean for payroll, and it can mean different things um, for different parts of the process. So the more traditional part that they're used to having in some way automated is the actual classic payroll engine. So yeah. Sage and Sage and Country or ADP in the US, um, and now our our software is above and over that because we're. Uh, our software is designed to manage all of the process around payroll. That's definitely new in the market, and and it's not something that people are fully uh, used to yet. They're used to using a payroll engine and then managing everything else through emails and spreadsheets. Um, and now we're getting outside of the actual calculation activity into the overall process management. Okay, that makes sense. So I guess from your perspective, then, as a shared services function or part of a shared services function, payroll is kind of the last bastion that's putting its its foot down and being a little bit resistant to change. But actually, all the other functions or most of the functions have already embraced it. So it's only kind of a matter of time. And it's just that it's going to happen. Obviously, Payslip has solutions which which um, support it as well. And you mentioned there that you've got, you know, it's, it's some of the new solutions that you offer. Can you just expand those a little bit more in terms of what makes Payslip new as a concept or some of the things that you're delivering, which which may be new to the more traditional type payroll functions that perhaps are a little bit nervous about change? Yeah, so the, the, the core, as I mentioned, the core part of payroll, which would always have been system led, is the actual calculation. And so you have a strong um payroll engines available in, in all markets and usually you have a choice within them even in small markets like Ireland there are two or three key leaders and they have engines available to be licensed by 
employers or by payroll providers as needed. Um, so outside of the payroll engine, though, the actual process of payroll um, has usually been one which is managed by email and personal coordination, lots of manual processes. So what Payslip does is we have a platform that brings together all of the different data streams that are needed into a global process above any particular country. So we're not delivering any calculations in country within our software. We're enabling a multinational company to go to a dashboard and know we have 27 entities across 16 countries. We're supporting 10,000 employees payroll through the system. And at any point in time, they can see which steps and actions for which payroll are due that week and who owns them, what needs to happen. And then a, they're managing the process centrally, and then B, through a very smart automation and integration, we have um, moved lots of traditionally manual and data exposing processes into being automated ones that bring them automation benefits in terms of validations and saving of time. Fantastic. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. I know that actually in my uh, preparation for this podcast, I obviously had a good read through your website and the, the things that you deliver, and there was a a particular word that was used quite a lot on your website and obviously in our conversations past the podcast as well, which is the word intuitive. So from your perspective, what does intuitive mean to you? And, and have you used intuitive solutions in inverted commas to ensure that payroll processing becomes a great experience to the to the end user? OK, so uh, it, it, intuitive to us is the most important kind of a target for anything that we build in Payslip to have it intuitive for the user. Um, and so nowadays, um, on, a, on a personal from a personal perspective, we all are using smartphones. We're all very digital enabled uh, and we're used to having everything very um, uh, visual and uh, have data represented to us in lots of different ways. So intuitive to us means that um, when a user is using the software, it, it's natural for them to know what to do. It's clear, it's easy, it's an enjoyable, positive experience. So it relates back to like a natural behavior. And, and what we did in, in designing our system um, for it to ensure it has a positive user experience was we tried to make sure it followed three core guidelines. One was that there was consistency, two, that there was optimization, and three, to always listen and learn. So what, what they mean really is that we um, built a platform using as much uh, simple and recognizable and smart iconography so that there's as, as few words as possible. So then it doesn't really matter if you're implementing the payroll system in China or in the US or in Japan or in, or in the UK, the iconography is clear about what you're doing and where you're doing it. So it follows a natural behavior that they know what the imagery looks like. So we, we have it designed to um, have a consistent messaging across all of the countries, regardless of, of the language. Um, and then the optimization means that there's as few steps as possible. So back to the payroll engines people are used to. Payroll engines, the legacy ones, weren't designed for good positive experience. They were designed to deliver a good calculation. And if that means it had to be checked and reviewed five times within the software, then that's what had to be done. But it wasn't building for it to be easy. It was building for it to be accurate and right. Whereas cool. what we've tried to do is turn it around and say, let's build a system that makes it so easy to, build, to manage your payrolls in any country on one platform that it builds human redundancy into your team and it builds system memory across all of the payrolls that then drives the automation of the workflow. Right. Great, fantastic. And actually, funny enough, you know, I work in payroll recruitment, so I'm speaking to, to payroll leaders daily, and we're always getting feedback from clients about what they like or dislike about a system. And that, actually, that, that can often include sort of new shiny systems as well. They might, as you say, do the calculation, but they're still getting frustrated with other elements of the system, such as inconsistent reporting. They say it's clunky. Uh, I had a client tell me recently that they had a, a, a new piece of software that had a, a lack of interface in, 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 with its uh, global vendors or and um, there were issues with its um, with its tools or the way that it delivers customer service. So even though people are implementing new systems, they're still finding there are issues with them. And maybe there isn't a perfect system out there as such. But I find that potentially it's due to sales teams from large providers, which have big pockets. They can sell amazing visions because they've got the investment to do that. But actually post implementation, post decision, when you've decided on the system that you want, actually sometimes the support side of things can let them down. 
So with that in mind, if you were a payroll manager listening to this podcast now, what kind of practical checklist or questions would you recommend a global payroll manager should consider asking if they want to change its payroll solution uh, provider or, or, or vendor? Yeah, um, I think it's a really good question. And we, we get asked this as well. And um, I know in lots of different industry conversations, whether it's at the CIPP conference in the UK in October or the APA Congress in the US in May, this topic comes up a lot. So what I think is it comes down to a few kind of simple steps in the process. Uh, as well as the specific question. So it's normal when you're going out to choose a new vendor in terms of payroll services as an aggregator or in country or a software solution that you define out your needs. And I, and I think the, the definition of that should lead into the, the weighting of the choice, but also into the questions that are used afterwards to frame the implementation and also to frame the client's referenceability. So sure. what I mean by all of that is if you're sitting down to look at your needs and just say you're looking for payroll services, well, what I find in lots of the conversations is people say to us, well, which countries do you look after? Um, they haven't even asked us whether we're a payroll services firm or what we are. They assume everybody's <laughs> a payroll services sure. firm. So I, I say to them, well, our system, we can build in any country because that's the way it's built. But on your payroll services, if that's what they're looking for a vendor for, they should define, well, what are their needs in terms of A, actual payroll services, B, in terms of support for their employees or their line managers or their HR people, after during the implementation of that um, and then most importantly how should what are the technology tools that the payroll services company is either offering or can integrate with so any payroll software that you're going to use whether it's an engine or an aggregator platform or a platform like ours you're going to be introducing it into a technology ecosystem already in your company so you should have those mapped out with your IT colleagues to know what is the ecosystem and what are the interfaces it needs to deal with and what are our requirements and they should be part of your requirements for your tendering and then what I would do is make sure that after you've gone through your process and you've long listed and shortlisted and talk to everybody, you should check the client references of the companies that you're thinking of buying from. And you should ask those clients exactly the questions you have. What is the ecosystem in your environment? Or ask the the company, the vendor that you're going to buy from to say, well, we run Workday, so we want one of the client references to have Workday. And then when you're talking to them, you can say, how was the implementation of the integration with Workday and what was the support like you had afterwards? And so especially whatever burning points you have from the contract that you're coming out of, use those as key questions at every part of your process, including the um, the vetting of the new provider, the actual client's referenceability, and then most importantly, the KPIs against which the actual fees are due during the duration of the contract. Fantastic. Wow. What a, what a brilliant checklist of, uh, of advice you've given there. It's fantastic. It's a really good roadmap. And I think, um, you know, if you are a global power manager listening to this now and you're considering a new vendor in the future, it, it's a good section of the podcast to, to store in your memory bank and, uh, and, and listen to again. I Interestingly, you mentioned there the client references. Um, I even there, I'd have a slight issue, and you know we have it in terms of the recruitment software that we've bought in in the past. But the client references you are given are obviously often going to be the best case, best case scenarios as well. So even then, it's difficult to get a true reflection of the experience of the implementation or the overall uh, review of it. So as a recruiter, if there are people out there considering solutions, you know, do pick up the phone and let us know because we'll often have access to contacts that are also using that software that may not be one of the official client references that might be able to give you a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a true representation of a warts and all version of a system, be it good or be it, be it bad. But I think there is sometimes a risk in using, the, or something what I've heard back in feedback, sometimes using those client references aren't always exactly as you'd like them to be. Um, that said, what a fantastic list of checklist points, if you like, to to consider a new system. So thanks so much for that. That was excellent. Yeah. Can I can I just come in there for a second? Yeah, for sure. I totally I totally agree with you on the point about the clients because you're not gonna give if you're somebody's choosing your service, you're not gonna give them a bad client reference. Cool. So uh but what I find is you can also ask companies who um 
have like a, a, a related software in the ecosystem. So, for example, a related software in our ecosystem is the ERP or the HCM that people are using. So, for example, we have a bunch of clients using Workday. We have a bunch of clients using Bamboo, HR. It depends on their size and where they are in their journey of growth. And so when we're talking to other companies and they say we're on a legacy HCM, we're not too happy with it at the moment, I always say to them, well, when you come to the point of reviewing them, we have clients with a bunch of different HCMs in place. And if you tell us which ones in your shortlist that you want to look to, we can introduce you to some of those clients and then you can get a real story from somebody that's not coming off the client's reference list from that vendor. Fantastic. Absolutely agree. And that's the kind of thing that we do as recruiters as well. So on a similar on a similar level, but yeah, I totally agree and, and fantastically put. So um, no, th- thanks for adding that as well. Now, at the moment, with many global pearl operations differing in terms of complexity, obviously we've got the, I think on my last podcast, we talked about the, the, the complexity list of where different global countries differ in terms of how complex their payroll processes are. Um, you've got lots of different levels of compliance, process, legislation. Now, I've, I'm correct in thinking, or something I read it, I understand that um, in terms of payslip, it's one of the only global payroll management software as a service options available in the market. Is that correct? Yes. So with that in mind, you've obviously been able to build a system that provides a positive user experience and have created your own niche. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you've managed to do that? And and I guess why why have you sort of been able to carve that niche out for you? Why didn't it exist before? And, and have you been able to really take hold of that? So we talked in our research before we built any of the software, uh, even though we had scoped out what we wanted to build, we'd scoped out the UX, we'd scoped out a lot of the screen interfaces. Before we actually built the engine behind it, we um, engaged with over 271 employers and payroll providers. Oh, wow. um, so I participated in some of the courses uh, run by the Global Payroll Management Institute in the US. We attended some of the conferences uh, here in Europe, such as IPAS. CIPP, talked to lots of payroll providers, and, and I asked them all the same questions. And the main questions I was asking was, well, who designed, what is your global payroll process? Um, and some of them would say they have one, some of them said they didn't. And then I say, who designed it? That was usually met with, by some cheer and, and humor. Um, and then I'd say, well, what, what global process would you like? And, and the overwhelming impact was that, uh, or outcome was that most companies didn't necessarily have a global payroll process. They had lots of parallel country processes, which were then shoehorned into some sort of a spreadsheet at the end in order to feed something useful in terms of data into their global GL reporting, their general oh. ledger reporting. So so then after that, I talked to them about well, what does your ideal global process look like? And what we did then was we took the most standard processes that everybody needs, whether it's um, an employer registration, an employer deregistration, employer contract provision, payroll calculations, compliance filings. And we uh, talked to a lot of people in different countries to identify what were the different steps um, that were relevant for that country. Plus, obviously, I had experience myself across 21 countries. And really what we did was we filtered it all the way up to having five or seven or three, depending on the process, global steps. And those steps stay the same on our system, regardless who the client is, whether it's a massive company in like 60 countries or a smaller multinational in like seven. Um, And then they stay the same. But then all the flexibility that you need for your company processes and your country requirements, they fall into the actions underneath those steps. So we have a few, very few, very structured, rigid rules in the system that bring everything back to a global level. And then, and then there's a lot of flexibility in behind that. Um, and that enables our clients then to have vendors in loads of countries or an aggregator in one region and then an ICP in big countries or ICP in the long tail countries. Um, and it gives all the flexibility around the processes for that. Um, and then because we have this global framework, for categorization and subcategorization, it enables all data to be consolidated back to those categories and to provide consolidated multi-country reporting. Um, so really, we bring all the data in. It all f- falls into its categories. And then from there, you can provide unified reporting back to the company uh, employer for their accounting or their HR systems. Great. 
Great. And as I think we, I've talked in a lot of the podcasts before with, with the, the role of the pale professional changing um, with the likes of, of, of robotic professional automation coming into play. I think, you know, the ability to have access to more reporting at your fingertips is only a good thing because the more reports and more data they can analyze and spend time analyzing, if some of the manual tasks are automated, you know, they can really use those reports to drive change at a, at a senior level and really, really affect businesses from a, from a more board level perspective. So it sounds like you're delivering some really good high level reporting um, capabilities to those global account managers as well, which is fantastic. So we're going to move yeah. on a little bit and just, just to find out a little bit more about you, Fidelma. I know in my introduction, I said that uh, there's a, an awful lot that you've achieved in your career today. You're a CEO, entrepreneur, a women in leadership advocate, and a bit of a, an expert when it comes to digital technology. So um, we're going to delve into that in a little bit more detail. If you work in payroll and you haven't checked out our latest song called My Payroll Career, then it's just been released and it's available now on iTunes or Amazon. Here's a little snippet of it to get you started. Enjoy. You see, I love payroll and payroll loves me. I don't mind liaising with HMRC. I love manual payments and calculating s and Yeah, payroll is the career for me. And that was My Payroll Career, available now in iTunes and Amazon Play. Right, back to the podcast. Time to find out more about you. First question to you is, how would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? I'd say they, did, they say that I don't really ring them often enough, to be very honest, because once I get involved in something, I get very absorbed. But um, uh, I'm pretty relaxed, I think, is probably what my friends would say. Because normally outside of work, I like to have things as unscheduled and unstructured as possible Okay. Uh, because we have so much going on. Uh, work colleagues, um, uh, they, uh, I'm very clear at the start for anyone that joins our team that I don't, I don't really like micromanagement. And if they want it, they should go work with somebody else. Yeah. So I think they would probably agree that I, sta- I stand true to that afterwards. Um, I've always had very strong uh, belief in that you spend more time at work every day than you do with your family. So it's good to try and organize work in a way that um, uh, is interesting and people feel like they achieve something and that they want to come in happy and then they go home happy. So I'm hoping that they'd also say that I support that. Uh, and we, we do provide a lot of flexibility in Payslip for people's lives. So um, I'd hopefully that they would uh, endorse that. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I've got a, a similar, I think a similar ethos myself in what we try to do at James Gray Associates. So uh, completely uh, love that, that, that approach good, to work. Good. Fantastic. I might check you out for the next day job. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or maybe check out our staff and see if, uh, uh, see what they think. But we've got a retention where most of the guys here in recruitment have been with me for 10 plus years, which in recruitment is really rare. So. Oh, that's unusual. Yeah. yeah all, you're doing a good job really in JGA. Of. Well done. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So tell us something that uh, perhaps other people wouldn't know about you. I'm a hiker okay. and a runner, and but I love eating cake. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually make quite a good porter cake if anybody needs a porter cake to be made. Um, I haven't made one in a while. Um, I don't know what a porter cake uh, is. Work-wise, I'm, What's a porter cake? Pardon? What's a porter cake? Porter, a porter cake is like a really nice fruit cake with some Guinness in it. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. And so it's nice and moist and you need one slice, the cup of tea, and then the whole day is good. Perfect. It sounds <laughs> it. Great. Okay. Um, and you, I, you mentioned you're running. Uh, is that something you, you, you do regularly? Are you just a, a, a fun runner or do you take it seriously in a competitive? So combination, it depends on the year. I, I try to run about, I always run twice a week. I try to run three or four times a week just in terms of fitness and mind space. Um, I haven't done any structured competitive racing in the last year or two. I did do some half marathons before that and lots of 10K runs, but then I just stopped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I figured I'd enough to target at work. It sounds like so, it. Yeah, um, it sounds like you've got a, a lot going yeah. on at work. It can be, it can be restrictive for sure. So let's. I also have three three sons who keep me running in different directions. It's not quite as structured or competitive, but it, it, it keeps me fit. I can imagine. I can imagine. God, I've got one son. He keeps me active, active enough. Let alone three. Uh, that would keep anyone fit. I think. Good. Uh, so you are abducted by aliens who want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? What item? One item. I'm going to assume that on the planet that we go to, we don't have uh, our electronic equipment won't work because that would be too easy. So I was thinking about this. I I think what would be good to bring with them would be a full 
uh, book of Shakespeare. Okay. Uh, because if you actually read and talk through any of them, you have um, pathos, you have humor, you have tragedy, you have the best of people and the worst of people. And I think that would be a really good basis for having a great conversation. Great. Fantastic. I'm a theatre man at heart myself. That's what I did my degree in. So that it certainly wins me over with that answer. Oh, good. So, uh, yeah, no, fantastic. I thought you were going to say Monopoly then for a second, which seems to be a very popular answer for people within the payroll industry, which I never expected. Why? So I think we've had about 10% of responses now have said Monopoly, at least three or four of the podcasts. Um, so I thought when you, I would never have thought of Monopoly. <laughs> well, I yeah. hadn't until I started doing it. Apparently, it's very, very popular. I thought with that little pause, that's where we were going to go there. But I like the Shakespeare. What on the on the subject of Monopoly? What game or instrument would you teach them? I had thought about Scrabble for this, but I hadn't thought about Monopoly. <laughs> I think though, in the end, I went for the music musical instrument. Yeah. So um, I, because I'm assuming I kind of go lightweight. I'm not a, a brilliant musician by any means. I think I'd probably just bring a tin whistle because a tin whistle is really easy. You have six holes, so if they have loads of fingers, you're okay, but not too many. And you can teach anybody to play the tin whistle in about 10 minutes. Right. Fantastic. Love that. What would you tell them about humans? I'd probably use my Shakespeare book to try and tell them about the depth of soul and how it can carry you through all the best and the worst of situations. Ah, fantastic. Very deep. And what? so in that basis, what truth or human trait would you hold back? I think these all end up going back to the seven deadly sins. So it's usually like things like greed, greed, uh, you know, avarice, ego, um, maliciousness, any of those kind of things, no, you know, like God, you the kind of real deep thought selfish ones. I like it. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> good. Well, what, we're going to dip back into some questions. Um, we've still got an awful lot to get through. And I, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, the seven deadly sins might turn us into a different uh, spin. Five technical questions. In terms of, of the payroll side, what other payroll innovations are you currently developing at present that might help continue, I guess, to drive the improvement experiences for employers and their global workforces going forward? Okay, so with any software company, we have our roadmap of what we want to build out. Um, there are core parts which are fully working and beautiful. And then I suppose the future ones are the enhancements, uh, which are very customer request led. So the parts which are totally functioning and, and loved by our clients at the moment include the automated workflow and it's all that already solves all of the issues they have around multiple inputs coming from so many multiple sources, whether it's a HR software, a time and attendance software, people out in the road sending in scanned pages of handwritten notes. That's all gone. <laughs> yeah. So we've already automated all of that. We've already automated and integrated all the data flows between the different parties. Um, we've already automated a lot of the validations and we already have an employee self service, which delivers a cohesive experience across all the world. So the main enhancements that we planned at the moment are there are additional validations and robotic, I suppose, automations that we want to add. So we've a lot of validations already that save uh, human time. For example, um, when the gross to nets are going over and back at different draft versions or even after the first draft, that you there are automatic validations that check it, that save uh, the, the payroll analyst doing their normal check. There's also exception reporting there. So we have some additional validations that we'd like to build that uh, – and, and we want to build some flexible options for clients to have their own uh, validations based on thresholds that they want for their own company policies. So we built the most structured ones that everybody automatically does. And now we're putting a bit more company personalization in it. And then the main piece that's going live over the coming months is actually payroll on file uh, personalization. So what that means is uh, you have a payer on file, the data comes back with your gross and nets, you know, you have all the columns in the, for the pensions at one part, you have all the columns for the salaries, another part, the, pe the temporary fees, another one. Individuals just like using them and visualizing the data in their own way. And what we find one of the biggest interesting behaviors that need to change is that everybody is so used to Excel spreadsheets that the first thing they always want to do is to download the spreadsheet and start moving the columns. Cool. Whereas actually our, ob our objective in our system is to deliver a closed system. So all the data is transferred through the system and there's no need ever again for an email with an attached spreadsheet. And for our clients who use our system properly, 
properly, there isn't. They never, even from the setup, they never send us a spreadsheet. Wow. Full stop. Right. It doesn't happen. Wow. So what we are doing now to to accommodate that behavior that people like to play with the, the spreadsheet they're looking at, we're building the personalization of the payroll file within our system. So they'll be able to drag and drop the columns into the location that they want. And we already have filter options and things like that that will help them. But once they drag and drop them in, in the sequence that they like, they can save that as their personalized uh, data format that they like. So then every other month when the data comes in and out, uh, out of the providers and back again, A, we consolidate the data back in. And then B, when that person goes to open it based on the personal profile, their, their personalized version of that will be in front of them. So that will help them a lot um, in terms of their user experience, but also just in terms of change management, people transitioning from an old system to a new one the least amount of change they have is the better. So if they can just organize it the way they like to, yeah. then off they go. Wow. And then they don't download anything and the data protection risk is gone. Sounds amazing. Um, I don't think I'd realized it was it was that complex. It's, you know, with all this talk about robotic process automation, it sounds like if people, if businesses or power managers are nervous about bringing it in and implementing it themselves, maybe they just need to implement your solution. A lot of it sounds like a lot of the RPA sort of processes have already been done through your solution. And maybe that's sort of a, a quick way through. Actually, I think I read some on your on your website that's um, paste it have been proven to reduce some payroll administration costs by up to thirty two percent. Presumably, that's utilizing some of that RPA technology that you, you just discussed and some of those reporting uh, automated reporting elements that you, you were talking through. I'm a, I'm assuming then you know you obviously are a keen advocate for automation because that's something that that's come through this podcast quite a lot and clearly you've automated all the processes and, and by the sound things are planning to to automate more. What kind of technologies then are, are you utilizing to be able to deliver the kind of payroll administration cost reductions that you've quoted at 32%? Uh, is that just in time, in terms of the administrative time that's taken for payroll departments to develop, or is it, is it cost safe from somewhere else? Yeah, it's a combination of factors, and that was an estimation uh, provided by our clients, um, and, and we, we did ask a broad question. So, first of all, our, our payslip is a cloud platform. So um, by, by definition, then it can be accessed by your you know, geo, dis, geographically dispersed team uh, in, in line with their own time zone, and it's easy. So there's no hardware maintenance costs for the client in doing that. Because it's in the cloud also, it's not on premise. So there's no updates needed. There's no IT team needed to support it. Um, if they want us to have single sign-on and uh, we can build that so that also re uh, enables their user experience to be easier and reduces any time even in those few seconds in terms of logging in. So um, I suppose the first key benefits are that it's cloud-based to start with. Um, then secondly, we have a very simple configuration process that we run at the start to map out the user roles, rights, permissions, access areas for each user within the client. Um, and what that does then is it automatically defines what data they have access to and what they can do with it. So all of that saves a huge amount of uh, management time every month uh, to make sure that the people have the right data that they need at the right time mm. and not the wrong data or too much data. Um, then, of course, you have the automated uh, validations that we mentioned already. Um, that's the key thing that they actually want because operationally, the the area for the, the biggest risk in terms of the actual calculations is when you have drafts coming in and out. So by having automated a lot of those um, validations, that saves them considerable amount of time and risk. Um, and then fourthly, we have a multi-level, in Payslip, we have a multi-level document repository system. So it also enables documents to be shared with an audit trail and documents to be stored at the most relevant point of the process or the setup. Um, so that saves time afterwards in tracking documents or storing them because there's also a reminder system when they need to be renewed. And then very lastly, um, all of the reporting uh, is at their fingertips. So one company I was speaking to even yesterday, they have, uh, let me see now, they have 37 entities across about 30 countries wow. and they have no single way at the moment to pull 
uh, multi-country pay element reporting. And they said if they were asked for it by the CFO, it would probably take them five weeks to work out how to pull all the data together. And then they wouldn't be sure it would be right just because they have so many interfaces. Whereas if we have those um, 30 countries on our system and the 37 entities, they could go in and it would be available to them now you know, because the data is there in real time. Oh. So all of that reporting and insight saves time. And when, when I list them, actually, it's probably more than 32%. <laughs> wow, fantastic. Well, there's another feature that I really want to um, explore more detail as well, which is based on, relates to your global vendor networks. But I'm going to jump to a quick advert break, and then we're going to jump back into that feature, if that's okay. Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find find out more. So Fidamba, one feature of Paysip that I was quite interested in was the fact that your solution with your solution businesses can manage and control entire vendor networks in one location on one user-friendly cloud platform. We just mentioned a little bit about the cloud related element to it. How does that work and how have you been able to achieve it? Because that seems like a, a huge uh, I guess a uh, benefit of your solution if you can actually manage entire vendor frameworks across global regions with just with just your solutions. How have you been able to do that? How did you map that out? All of our system is designed with the employer um, at the center. Um, so the vendors are supplying into them and they're providing different services. So as I mentioned earlier, we have global led processes designed um, from the start and then the flexibility falls in for each country falls in underneath that in terms of the actions so similarly the vendor is uh, built the payroll provider or vendor it could be it doesn't have to be payroll it could be global mobility vendor it could be anything um, the payroll provider or vendor in this instance is an integral stakeholder in that process that's mapped at a global level uh, so we have three portals in our in our payslip system we have the payslip employer portal we have the employee self-service portal and then thirdly we have the payroll provider portal so when you've mapped out a, a process just say it has five steps and Step C relates to the payroll provider. Well, then when the workflow moves along from step B to step C for the payroll provider, they uh, get their automated alerts to say that there is work waiting for them to do and they um, access all of the data securely through their portal and we've organized integrations with them at configuration so that they can upload the data directly into their local payroll engine and output it back to us and it gets converted back in. Um, and then any of the additional files or data sets that they need to provide to us after the gross to nest are done, they can upload as well through um, the specific pay run folder in a very structured manner. So it feeds all the data back into the right part of the system for the employer. And once that is done, the employer gets an alert to say that the vendor has done their work. So we've planned it at a very strategic level. Uh, we built the payroll provider portal to have have a positive user experience in the same way as the other two component portals of Payslip. Um, and then we have a very structured way of onboarding a vendor to make it easy for them to know what to do for the employer. Wow. So, sounds amazing. I'm gonna, um, I think you've covered that really well. So I haven't got any questions left. So I had a couple more I was going to answer. I think you've answered them. I sort of asked. You've answered them already in your answer, which is fantastic. So I'm going to take a slight different direction with that, with the questions. And I want to just find out a bit more about your experience in working with the Going for Growth initiative, of which, of course, you're a lead entrepreneur for. Um, it was launched by Paula Fitzsimmons after she recognized that a gender gap existed in ambition amongst entrepreneurs. I think subsequently then the Going for Growth initiative was developed to help nurture and support ambitious female entrepreneurs, of course, of which you are a, a great example of. And I believe it recently celebrated its 10th anniversary as well, if that's correct. So what has this work involved for you? and and do you see the gender gap improving? We've obviously got gender gap reporting now that's come in, and there's a lot of press at the moment about the gender pay gap, particularly with the with the International Women's Day just taking place this week as well. It's very much in the, in the public eye. What's your view on it? And, and tell me a little bit more about the work that you've been involved in with the growing the growth uh, initiative. 
Yeah, so the Going for Growth initiative was established, as you said, by Paula Fitzsimons. Um, it was Irish-led, um, though there are kind of an international element, uh, elements arising now. Um, it, it was based on research that Paula Fitzsimons was doing as part of the GEM report for Europe, which is the Gender Entrepreneurship Monitor. Um, and it's a, a piece of research that's done every year across all the EU countries. Um, and uh, in doing the research for Ireland, she saw that there was every single year, there was always double the amount of new businesses set up each year by men than there were for women. And she just decided she'd seen enough of it and that she sh that somebody needs to do something about it. So she got up and did it. So the Going for Growth program is based on, I suppose, the um, science-based research that women are more inclined to take a risk if they know another woman who's taken similar risks. So it's a bit like that concept of years ago that, you know, women go to the well to talk to the other women about it. Um, so I was about to say that if they knew another entrepreneur who'd done well, they were more likely to be entrepreneurial themselves right. or to take that sure. leap and to take sure. the risk. Um, so um, the Going for Growth program means that uh, a business, a businesswoman who set up a, an entrepreneur who set up a, a business which is two years or more um, and has a growth agenda uh, can apply for the program um, in the November to December period each year. The program, the cycle runs from January to June and uh, there are tables of entrepreneurs. There's usually eight businesses to a table and there's one lead entrepreneur to a table and those eight businesses do not compete with each other in any way. And then there's a program that you go through. The businesses meet once a month for three hours to go through the program and it really takes you through all of the different elements of the business from sales and marketing to your, your financial KPIs to funding to... Uh, you know, all the different uh, parts of business that you would do in driving a business. Um, what do I think about it? I think it's fantastic. The evidence speaks for itself. In one of the years, the cycle I had of the eight businesses at the table, there were 27 new jobs created by the eight business women by the end of the six months and over 50 by the end of that year. Um, so it grows. Um, they grow in headcount. They grow in exporter status. They grow in revenue. They grow in profitability. Um, and really, the feedback would be that it's, it's nearly like having a free board of directors, except that nobody has any agenda other than to tell you what they think because whether you you know grow or not it's, it's up to you so it's a really good forum in which to uh, discuss uh, what you're facing the challenges you face in the business and what strategies other businesses have taken to try and meet those challenges head on and to grow successfully I think it's a great program it's extremely positive um, or overall over all the years um, there are about 60 businesses involved each year and there's always an increase in headcount, increase in profitability on average and the increase in the number of exporters and stability as a result. So I think it's extremely successful and a testament to Paula for what she said. Fantastic. Up. Fantastic. And, and do you see the at the moment, what's your view on the gender pay gap? Do you think it's improving within the payroll industry specifically? Are you seeing improvements at that end or do you think there's still a long way to go? I mean, from my perspective, I think on the payroll side, we're quite fortunate as an industry. We've got some really strong female entrepreneurs and leaders which shape the future of our, of our payroll market and there's people such as Alison Seller, OBE, um, Philip Turney, Ross Hendren, Kate Upcraft, Lynette Gibbons, Jackie Featherbridge, Mel Pizzi and, and others. Some of those have already been on the podcast. Some of those I've worked with and known for, for a number of years. Um, and there are also many of these individuals and, and more have launched their own payroll bureau businesses or payroll software solutions businesses such as yourself, Adelma. So do you think payroll is I guess one of the few industries or, or one of the rare industries, if you like, where actually I think it's it's one of those industries that's kind of leading the way for female entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know what the figures are. I don't have the stats to back that up. But certainly there are a number of reference points um, that I have for people that are launching their businesses. And I guess if you compare those to, I mm -hmm. think there's only 23 female CEOs on the FTSE 100 or FTSE, I think it's FTSE 100. Uh, which shows there's a real disparity there in, in, in other businesses. Actually, within payroll, it doesn't seem to be necessarily the case. Do you think that the industry still needs to do more, or do you think it is an, an industry where actually it's kind of bucking the trend? Okay, I think it's a really good question. So there's a few different ways to look at it. So firstly, from my understanding of the rates of entrepreneurship, um, there's always higher rates of entrepreneurship by people in the industries. Um, 
sorry, there's a higher rate of female entrepreneurship in industry verticals with strong female participation. So I would have seen this over the years in going for growth. You've a, you've a, a stronger percentage of all the businesses in beauty, a stronger percentage in food sure. and catering, or a stronger percentage in hospitality because they're traditional industries with high female participation. I think payroll has high female participation. I don't know the stats either, but you would see it when you go to the APA Congress at the CIPP Congress that there, I always think that there seems to definitely be like a, um, a majority to some degree, at least on the female side, you know, um, whether, so I think it's probably more that there's higher involvement, um, by females there historically. I think does that lead to entrepreneurship? I think. If you are a pure, and I, I mean this in the best sense of the word, if you're like a pure payroll person who likes doing the calculations and being involved in in the weeds and the, the hard work of doing payroll, I think it's going to be very hard to be an entrepreneur because you're going to have to jump outside of it and be a risk sure. taker, you know. Um, so they don't necessarily uh, parallel with each other. But at the same time, all the examples you gave, absolutely, Alison Seller especially, and um, uh, um, we see it with the, um, the leader in Ceridian over in the, the US as well. Um, I think that they, you know, they moved very quickly through their organizations and they saw a gap in the market and then they, they built out on that. So they, even when they were involved in the nitty gritty, they always kept an eye to the strategic picture. Um, so I do think payroll is definitely, uh, a, an industry vertical that has opportunity for women. Uh, I think that you are right. There was good, strong representation there. Uh, but I'm sure as, um, as, as all industries are going through changes now with digitization, there will even be more opportunity in, in future years. Fantastic. I have to say, I should add as well that um, I was brought into the recruitment industry through a female entrepreneur within payroll that many people will know. I think she was one of the first, certainly non-payroll person to win the Strathern Award for payroll services, which is Chris Fitzgerald. And obviously she launched Payroll World magazine before it was sold um, to, to award strategy. Um, and actually she launched um, the, the, the payroll agency that I that first looked, started my career. And she was a very inspirational female entrepreneur. Um, and I don't know how prevalent they are in the very recruitment good. industry, but certainly she put me on my journey. So, um, and Mel Pizzi is someone Fantastic. I worked alongside um, th through through Chris as well. And Mel's gone from strength to strength for GPA and other bits and pieces. So um, I think Indeed. we said, yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a great example. I, I'm great seeing, for me, just seeing anyone's career just blossom and, and, and improve and develop. And Mel, you know, she was a consultant sat next to me 15 years ago, and now she's the CEO of, of the GPA. Yeah, well, I think it's very useful for the industry to have an association. Yes. And I know that Mel brought the Global Payroll Association events to Ireland. A colleague in arms in the Global Payroll Management Institute in the, in the US, Mary being Holland, Mary Holland, yeah. has done yeah. similar veins for the APA under Dan Maddox. So I, I think you're right. Uh, maybe we should showcase it uh, yeah. as well. There's a new I, well, idea. I, I think we should. It's all about bringing, you know, raising the profile of the industry. And maybe that's a good way to, to add on to that process. And I think it's something we can certainly, there's some really good leaders there we can champion. And you know, Alison Sellers is, is one that you mentioned as well, you know, actually mm. been recognized with an OBA. Yeah, they're fantastic right. work. Final well, last question before we enter the vault. If I asked you to predict <laughs> the future of global payroll, assuming it embraces automation, roboticization, and artificial intelligence, what do you think it will look like in five years from now? And how will the challenges that global payroll leaders, are, which they're facing now, differ to those, I guess, to the ones that they might face in the future? Yeah, so I think there's loads going on at the moment. So I think there's challenges from the automation and digital uh, robotization um, that you've mentioned. There's also loads of challenges from increasing compliance requirements in different countries. So from the digitization, I think, uh, most of not all of the manual processes that are there now will um, be replaced by some level of digital software or tools, whether that's a customized tool like our system and payslip for the global payroll industry, or whether it's just a strong use of uh, established systems like SharePoint and um uh, and, and similar products in the market. So first, I think most of the manual processes will have gone. I think the role of the payroll analyst and payroll leader will have moved from uh, like uh, any involvement in the manual processes to insights and forecasting and strategic thinking based on the actual payroll data that's in front of them. Um, they will have that data, I think, from systems. The only challenge with all of that will be 
um, as as compliance continues to increase in country and the tax codes become more and more complicated across all the different countries, the cost of the integration of those systems in country back into Global One will continue to be expensive and even more expensive because the integration is the, often the expensive part that takes a lot of investment. So I think that um, where there could end up being very strong systems available to multinational employers, but that the cost of building it might end up being expensive and there could end up being a gap for a while in the kind of multinational SMB for the want of a better reference. So all of the stats would now show that um, the multinational companies are becoming multinational much faster than ever before. And because of the global war for talent, people hire the best person uh, for the job, regardless of where they are. And they very often work from their home countries. And then suddenly a company that might only have 50 people in their core office could end up having 20 people in seven other locations very easily. So the, the, the concept of the workforce is broadened from the employees out to include contractors, gig workers, uh, temp workers, loads of different types. And at some point, the employer is going to have to bring them together in one system to manage. But then they're kind of worried about the contractor requirements in different countries as well. So I think there's going to be challenges from both directions. It's going to make it easier because of the digitization, but the actual increasing requirement to be compliant in country is going to make it in some ways harder uh, for different types of employees and when you're bringing that mix together. Um, and then lastly, because of the global war of talent, payroll isn't uh, – is, is moving from kind of a back office mandatory process that everybody expects to be on time to being a benefit. Like in the US with daily pay, how you pay somebody, how you deliver payroll and what their payroll experience is like on their employee self-service or on their app or on their phone, it becomes part of the, the uh, differentiators for employers in the market. So the expectations of the payroll services is increasing and is led by often the consumer experiences that the employees uh -huh. have. Well, I think uh, I'm, I'm really thankful that you've given that response because you've emphasized the global war on talent, which is uh, obviously leans towards what we specialize in, which is finding talent. And I have to admit, it um, it it, it is going to get harder as, as the skills become more specialist. It's going to get harder and harder to find that talent. And that talent, as you say, isn't necessarily going to be located in the UK anymore. It could be based anywhere that, that the, the, the shared service centers, if you like, are going to be based or even people are going to be working more and more remotely. As, as technology improves as well. So to find people that understand software and understand you know, how, to, how to do all the intricacies of global payroll utilizing the, the kind of software solutions that are out there. Um, I think it's going to make payroll, it's already niche, but I think it's going to make payroll recruitment even more niche. Um, and I'm hoping that will play to our strengths as a specialist recruiter, but certainly it's going to throw up some, uh, some real challenges to a number of businesses out there that you know, want to progress, but just can't find the talent to support it. But using cloud software platform liberates their recruitment. Like as a, as a specialist recruiter and you know where all the payroll people are. If I'm based in London and I need an Italian payroll specialist and I'm only looking in London, I'm competing with all the other businesses and it's going to be very expensive and there mightn't be very many of them. But if I can hire an Italian payroll specialist with fluent English based in Italy because I have a cloud platform through which they can work and they can come up once a month into London, but well, suddenly the whole market opens up and the whole uh, ROI of uh, having a specialist um, yeah, is easier. Sure. I mean, th th it's already happening. I mean, this month placed uh, a, a number of um, German payroll specialists, was fluent in English, to be based in Berlin. Uh, we recently placed a Russian-Ukraine payroll specialist that was based over in Munich, again, needed languages. And I think it's changing all the time. And we've relocated people over from all countries to, to, to the UK and, and from the UK to abroad as a, a client of ours based in Barcelona, where we've recruited 20 of their team. Uh, it's a UK payroll function that's it's running out of uh, out of Barcelona. In all the Great, time. you need to. I think that's good. It's good recruitment on your part. It's fantastic to have those services available, and so now you'll have to tell them. Yeah, to use absolutely, payslip. absolutely. Well, <laughs> to join forces, but so we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give to okay. someone working in payroll right now. Um, I think you should take whatever you're doing as an as is and assume it's not the way it should be and look to your own 
personal digital experiences and what you expect and assume that that is the minimum of what your employees expect from their payroll service and then look to see how you can get there. With the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? I probably would have studied something totally different in university because since I've been to university, I know that what I studied was totally irrelevant for what I did afterwards. So I would have actually studied what I wanted to study. So history is actually what I really wanted to study. And I didn't because I didn't know what it would do for me except give me make me a history teacher. So I'd probably just go off back to university and change altogether and not study business in German, just study history in German. And then yeah, still fantastic. go into business. Well, fair enough. <laughs> uh, if you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Uh, simplify some of the tax codes. Right. Fantastic. Who motivates you and why? It's a really corny answer, but at the moment it's our clients. Because when you hear what they're what they're struggling with or where they need to get to, it's the best motivation to make sure the software gets implemented in a really easy way, that they love it, that they love their experience. So in Payslip, we have a hypercare way of looking after the clients for all the perils for the first three months, which is very iterative and it makes sure that the adoption is is easy and, and loving it. Um, and, and what they're trying to get to helps motivate us to do that. So it's a very corny answer, but I have to say our cool. clients. That's cool. It works for me. <laughs> and last question. If you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? So this is very personal. Uh, I moved with my family from Dublin to the west of Ireland in 2015 uh, to leave the big city life deliberately. Um, and I live at the very west coast beside the Atlantic Ocean next stop, uh, New York. So the only thing to do here is either work with Allergan making Botox, <laughs> okay. which they do here, or work in one of the fantastic hotels. So I had to come up with something because I'm no good to any of them working in hotels or Allergan. So at the time, I remember thinking, looking out at the ocean, because there isn't a local market, that I had to come up with some software for a multinational client base or to do something with seaweed. So if I hadn't come up with Global Payroll Software, I probably would be making some sort of seaweed soaps to oh, seaweed on the that. beach. You certainly can't <laughs> take the entrepreneur uh, out of you then. Whatever happens, it's like, no, I don't want to work in a hotel. I'll just create another business and make it work. I love that. Great. Fantastic. They're great hotels, but, you know, customers like micromanagement and I, <laughs> yeah. not, I don't want no, to do that. So. <laughs> but it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the, on the podcast. Today. I've learned, learned so much about automation across global software. I mean, it's um, actually it was, it's been really eye opening for me. So it's been a fantastic conversation. As I say, you're definitely one of those female entrepreneurs that other payroll professionals, I'm sure, will look up to. So thank you ever so much for joining me today. There are a couple of links I am going to mention for those interested in finding out more. One is, of course, the Going for Growth initiative that we mentioned, which if you want to find out more about that, you can go to www.goingforgrowth.com. Of course, if you want to find out more about Payslip and its wonderful solution, then please go to www.payslip.com. And I'll also put a link in the episode notes to um, Del McGurk's LinkedIn profile as well. So if you want to contact with Delma directly, you can do so through the LinkedIn portal and um, obviously start any conversations directly there as well. But otherwise, just a huge thank you, Delma, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, I look forward to speaking to everyone again in a couple of weeks. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.